we all know that falling objects in a gravitational field do so in an accelerated fashion. Their velocity increases because the force of gravity continuously pulls them towards the ground. And a constant force equals acceleration. But what if we now include the frictional force acting on the object by the surrounding air, which is basically the force that is a result from the collective collisions of the air molecules with the object. And this force tries to slow down the object. In fact, the higher the object's velocity, the larger the frictional force that tries to slow it down. Given these forces battling it out, what is the exact time evolution of this object's velocity? Will it just keep on increasing with a constant acceleration? Or will it slow down after a while and even at some point become constant? Well, this is what we will find out. In the first step, we find the equation of motion by using Newton's second law. The net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. The two forces acting on the object are the force of gravity, m times g pointing downward, and the frictional force, which is minus a constant, k, times the velocity. Adding them together yields the equation of motion. What we want to get from this equation is the time evolution of the velocity, so the velocity as a function of time. We see that the equation contains both v and the time derivative of v, which is the acceleration. This is called a differential equation, which brings us to the second step, solving it. When we write down this differential equation, we see that there are two variables that we're interested in. The variable that is pertaining to v, the velocity, which occurs in the term that comes from the frictional force, and in the enumerator of this derivative. On the other hand, we have the variable t, which only occurs in the denominator of the derivative. Differential equations of this type we can solve by using separation of variables, which means that we separate each of these variables to one side of the equality sign. We bring dt to the left-hand side of the equality sign, and all of the terms that have a v or dv we bring to the other side of the equality sign. And so you can see that at this point the variables are separated. In the next step, we integrate both sides of this equality sign. On the left we have an integral over t, and on the right we have an integral over v. Now looking at the boundaries, we start on the left hand side, we start from time 0 all the way to some arbitrary time t. On the right hand side we need to have matching boundary conditions. So at the lower boundary of this velocity integral, we need to have our initial velocity, the velocity when time is equal to zero, and we choose this velocity to be zero. Now the upper boundary of this integral will be the velocity at the time step t is equal to capital T. And now we can start computing these integrals. The left hand side is very straightforward. This will simply be this arbitrary time capital T. On the right hand side, we use the substitution method. We go from dv to dm times g minus k times v. And because we multiplied v with minus k, we need to compensate this by multiplying by minus 1 over k. Having done this, we see that we get an integral of d something divided by that very something. And you probably recognize this type of integral, which has as a result the logarithm of that something. This makes this integral very straightforward to compute simply the logarithm of whatever is inside of these d brackets filled in in its boundaries. The upper boundary we simply have v being v of capital T and in the lower boundary we have v is equal to zero. So we get the difference of two logarithms. And at this point we see that we've gone from a differential equation to an algebraic equation with on the left hand side the time parameter capital T and on the right hand side the velocity function of this time parameter, which we are trying to find now. So what we're left to do is to isolate this v of t on one hand side of the equality sign. We know that the difference of two logarithms can be written as one logarithm. If we then bring this constant factor minus m divided by k to the other side of the equality sign, we have effectively isolated the logarithm on the right hand side. Then in an effort to get this v of t inside of this logarithm isolated, we exponentiate both sides of this equation, because we know that e to the power of ln of x is equal to simply x. So on the left hand side this factor with the parameter t ends up in the exponent, and on the right hand side we finally have access to our v of t. And in our final step we can write that v of t is equal to m times g divided by k multiplied by 1 minus this e power with t in the exponent.
And this gives us our final result, the exact function for how the velocity changes with time. Now, before diving into the details and the graph of this function, there are two things to note here. First, it is clear that the time variable only shows up in this one minus a negative exponential. And second, this factor in front of the brackets shows the competing forces battling it out. In the enumerator, we have g from the force of gravity, trying to speed up the object, increasing its velocity. In the denominator, we have this constant k, coming from the frictional force which tries to slow down the object. To end off, let's dive into the details and specifically into the graph of this function to see whether we can abstract any limiting cases to check whether our result actually makes sense or not. When we plot this function with velocity on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, we get something like this. We see that while our velocity does indeed increase rapidly and thus signifying acceleration at the start, it tempers off and goes to an equilibrium. Therefore, after some time of falling, we reach a constant velocity. And this is of course the terminal velocity. But what is the exact expression for this terminal velocity? Well, having our formula at hand, we can easily obtain it. Namely, we just look at the limit where t goes to infinity. Filling this in, we see that this e power becomes e to the power of minus infinity, which is of course zero. Therefore, we get one minus zero, which is simply one. And what remains is this factor in front of it, m times g divided by k. And thus, for the terminal velocity, we again see this clear competition between the gravitational force pulling the object towards the ground and the frictional force trying to reduce its velocity. The second limiting case is to look at timescales that are very small, just after the object starts falling. And this is a perfect example of Taylor expansion. Let's remind ourselves that e to the power of minus x can be Taylor expanded as 1 minus x plus 1 over 2 x squared and so on and so on, for x being very very small. And in this case this minus x is equal to minus k over m times t. So if we replace this e power with the Taylor expansion in our velocity function, we get the following. And at this point this function can be looked at term by term. First, if you look at the first term, the zeroth order expansion term, we simply get 1. So inside of our brackets, we get 1 minus 1, which is 0. So our velocity for a very small time is equal to 0. And this makes sense. This is only at the very, very start, where our initial velocity is indeed 0. Let's take it a term further, the first order approximation. Here, within the brackets, we get k divided by m times our time t. Now we can cancel out quite a lot, this mass cancels out, this k cancels out, and we are left with g times t, which is a linear function. And the physical explanation of this linear behavior, so a constant acceleration at very small timescales, is because the frictional force is proportional to the velocity. Therefore, right when we start falling, our velocity is very small, and therefore the frictional force is very small, which leaves us with only the force of gravity which results in a constant acceleration and thus a linear increase in velocity. Now we could go on taking higher and higher Taylor terms, but I think it's good to stop here. If you enjoyed this, give it a thumbs up and I will see you in the next one. Bye.